So this is a 66-year-old female referred for evaluation of pulmonary hypertension. Um, history is noteworthy for a murmur noted early in life. She had a new uh, primary care physician who noted that murmur and sent her for a transthoracic echo. And there was a long report, but among other things, that uh, echo reported pulmonary hypertension. And the patient's daughter was in health care and said, I think we should get an uh, opinion elsewhere. So cardiovascular review system, she had some fatigue. She exercised every day and um, had no exertional dyspnea, rare palpitations, but no reported arrhythmias, um, no lightheadedness or syncope, and then very rare lower extremity edema. Um, her exam, blood pressure was normal. BMI was normal. Um, you can see height and weight there. Venous pressure um, was normal, no carotid bruise. And then she had a grade four holosystolic murmur noted at the left sternal border. Um, the first and second heart sounds were not distinctly audible. There was no third or fourth heart sound detected. And the apex was displaced. No lower extremity edema. And here's her electrocardiogram. And chest x-ray. And then we'll look at her echocardiogram. So end diastolic dimension um, enlarged for this patient, 57. So velocity across that area of color flow is 4.7 meters per second. Inflow here. And velocity over four meters per second. And then apical imaging, and I left this in the congenital format, so left-sided chambers, right-sided chambers, and then the uh, velocity obtained from the apex Again, around four meters per second as reported. So what do you think? What's the diagnosis? Pulmonary hypertension, VSD and pulmonary hypertension, severe TR, or something else? So VSD and pulmonary hypertension. You'd agree with the referring. Um, OK. What would you do next? More imaging, cardiac cath, exercise, reassurance. So more than one of the above is often correct. But when more imaging is an option, it's usually the correct. So here, I think, is a very important part of this patient's uh, echo exam. We're looking at the pulmonary valve. There's trivial or mild pulmonary valve regurgitation. And we can see here that the pulmonary regurgitant end diastolic velocity is about one meter per second. So Will, what's the likelihood that the patient has severe pulmonary hypertension? I think if you, it's on. If, you believe, if you believe the signal, then this is consistent with normal PA pressures. And I just want to point out something else. You know, we put a lot of emphasis on the, on the end diastolic velocity because that's how you can get the PA end diastolic. So basically, you get that velocity, you just Bernoulli it, and then you add the IVC. But I think it's important also to pay attention to the opening. You can see here that the opening pressure is below 2. So that matches the PA early diastolic, or late systolic velocity, and then if you were to Bernoulli that again, you would see that the PA pressure is very low at the beginning of diastole. So sometimes you can have a low end diastolic pressure, but you can have a high opening pressure, and that, that can be seen in pH. So the fact that you have both normal values, I think, is reassuring. 
Okay. And then um, uh, Will commented on the ACHD guidelines published in JAC and circulation in 2018. So these are the, this is the schema for a ventricular septal defect in the adult. If there's left to right shunt, then you really need more information. Is the left ventricle enlarged? What is the QPQS? What's the pulmonary artery systolic pressure, et cetera? And so obviously this patient needs additional information with a cardiac cath. So uh, both groups, of course, were right. Um, and this is actually a case that uh, Will did. Do you want to comment on what we see here? Sure. And this is the old way of diagnosing VSD. You can see on the, yeah, on the right-hand side as we inject contrast in the LV, you can see flow going to the PA. You can see the, the, the balloon wedge catheters in the PA, and you can see flow crossing the ventricular septum and going up the PA. So this, is, this fits with, with the patient's VSD. And I don't have those beautiful hemodynamic drawings like uh, Will does, but uh, membranous VSD was the diagnosis. The QPQS was 1.6. And then you can see the, the um, pressures there. Will, any comments or pretty self-explanatory? Yeah, agreed. And so I guess my big question is, why was this patient thought to have pulmonary hypertension? Why did you think she had pulmonary hypertension? And I think going back to the echo and another imaging tip, so important for all of us who image patients, for the sonographers in particular, but also those of us who image patients regularly. Um, in this patient, it was an artificial um, report of pulmonary hypertension, and that's because the VSD flow contaminates uh, that quote unquote TR velocity. So here you can see that it was, a, it was a pretty authentic looking jet of tricuspid regurgitation. But actually if we go back to the short axis view, we can see the flow through the VSD here and then it kind of takes a turn and goes through the tricuspid valve. And so it really contaminates that TR velocity. And so you cannot rely on the TR velocity to assess pulmonary pressure in this particular patient. Even in our lab, we couldn't say for sure um, what the TR velocity was. But of course, knowing what the pulmonary regurgitant um, uh, velocity was, was very helpful. Yep. Question here, I think it goes with what you were just saying. I think, I presume this, this is a cath person too. Said that there was LV to RA shunt and from a technical standpoint, given the proximity between the VSD and the tricuspid valve, and typically there is TR because the septal leaflet tries to close the defect, some of the VSD flow goes backwards. So if you were to sample the RA for your saturation run, for example, is typically high. So that's why you go SVC, IVC. So on the Android, it looks like there's LV to RA shunt, but it's just the TR taking some of the contrast back into the, uh, into the RA. So it's not a true Garbodi defect. And so then to determine what to do next, I think we go back to the guidelines. And here, our patient's hemodynamics, uh, QPQS greater than 1.5 to 1, PA systolic pressure was less than 50% uh, systemic, and she had LV enlargement, and so we recommended surgical closure. Um, device closure really wasn't a good option in this patient because of the location of that VSD, and this is just the guidelines for your reference. So the learning objectives for this case were to understand the clinical diagnostic and imaging features of VSD, and then to differentiate causes of, quote, pulmonary hypertension reported by transthoracic echo. Similar to Will's um, anatomic demonstration, this is from Dr. Bill Edwards' um, collection, and this is a membranous VSD, and you can see the close proximity of that beautiful example of the membranous VSD to the aortic valve cusps here, and so it's not surprising that associated features include aortic valve disease, and then as we saw in our patient, tricuspid valve disease. Exactly as Will said, that septal tricuspid leaflet tries to close off the VSD and then um, it causes tricuspid regurgitation. Other associations include endocarditis, and then an entity, which I'll show you shortly, called double-chambered right ventricle. And then management depends on the size and associated features. And here's just a different patient and you can see also that this is a membranous VSD. It's close to the tricuspid valve. Some people like to say, look at the aortic valve as a clock face. Um, I actually like to say, is it close to the tricuspid valve or is it close to the pulmonary valve to determine what type of VSD it is? So this we would say membranous or perimembranous VSD in close proximity to the tricuspid valve. And then you can see the left to right shunt here. There's not that um, dis, um, uh, contamination with the TR velocity in this particular case. And then long axis, again, difficult to 
exclude an outlet BSD in the long axis view, but you need the combination of long axis and short axis. Again, the imaging of these patients is so critical. So membranous VSD, the most common type of VSD that you'll see in adults, adjacent, as I've already explained, to the aortic and tricuspid valves. As we mentioned, the tricuspid valve can become adherent as it tries to close off that VSD, and rarely you see aortic cusp prolapse that leads to progressive AR. And then as demonstrated here, long axis and short axis views nicely demonstrate uh, the anatomic features. Yeah? So there was a question here, I think it was actually a comment, and they're absolutely right that the tricuspid valve looked abnormal and thickened. So sometimes the, the tricuspid valve might be primarily abnormal. And I think just a tip when you're actually scanning these patients, I find the subcostal view very helpful because the VSD will be coming towards you, whereas the tricuspid valve grade, uh, jet will be going the wrong way. So then when you're Doppling, they go in opposite ways, and then it might be easier to separate the two that way. And I mentioned I'd just uh, uh, make a comment about double-chambered right ventricle. So it's not an uncommon entity that you will see or that we see in patients, and they've always had a history of a murmur since early in life. So this is a schematic that demonstrates the features of double-chambered right ventricle. So it occurs in association with a membranous defect. It's a progressive hypertrophy of right ventricular muscle bundles. Um, at the infundibular and superior margin of the VSD. Uh, there's a proximal high pressure area here and then a distal low pressure area, and we see um, them not infrequently. So reported to occur in 3 to 10% of patients with membranous VSDs, rarely associated with arrhythmias, but patients can present with symptoms of dyspnea, uh, and uh, the um, treatment of choice for severe obstruction is operative intervention. So take-home points with regard to ventricular septal defects in adults. A small VSD shouldn't cause pulmonary hypertension, and I think we could see the anatomic boundaries of that VSD pretty well and didn't think it was large. The VSD jet can contaminate tricuspid regurgitation um, velocity and cause that pseudo-pulmonary hypertension picture. And then LV enlargement is an indication for VSD closure in the absence of significant pulmonary hypertension. So in this case, clearly cath was required to confirm the pulmonary pressures, uh, but then also operative intervention was suggested. 